If everyone's ready, we can start in a moment. Thanks a million. <laughs> Hello, everybody. And you're very welcome today to the Royal Society of Antiquaries. It isn't actually the Royal Society of Antiquarians, which is where I thought we were going to be speaking for a long time. So despite that, you can trust me, even though I'm not quite sure where we are. Um, my name is Eloise Heron. I'm a valuation surveyor. And I've always been interested in sustainability. And I was lucky enough to do a master's in Bolton Street a number of years ago. And I just try and incorporate sustainability throughout my working life as a surveyor. With this in mind, we set up a working group um, in this society last year, and um, it was set up really with the main purpose to keep fellow surveyors abreast of all sustainability issues as best as we can ourselves, and then also to get external speakers in. And with this in mind, we set up this, which is our first uh, CPD, and we're just holding it ourselves, um, and it's an introduction, it's a light touch to sustainability in the built environment. Our speakers today are GP and building surveyors. Um, we have John Shannon, who's in Cushman and Wakefield, Megan Burke in CBRE, Brian Meldon, Meldon Chartered Surveyors, and Oliver Held in Jones Lang LaSalle. As I said, it's a light touch introduction, and we really want to follow this with um, more in depth CPDs. And with this in mind, we'd really like you to tell us what you want us to set up for you. And if you could feed, ba feed that back at the end, that would be great. Against the backdrop of global warming, humanity is also facing by 2030, global population increasing from 6 to 8 billion, demand for food increasing by 50%, and demand for energy and water increasing by 30%. Climate change, resource scarcity, environmental degradation, pollution and poverty are just some of the issues that are facing us today. Today we're going to see how the built environment fits in with this in terms of sustainable development. What I would say to you if this is one of your first introductions to sustainability is don't be overwhelmed by what you're going to see today, even if it is the begin an introduction, because everything matters and everything we do in our lives, in our personal lives and in our business lives matters. Um, and it, Everything we do sends a message to our friends and our families and our colleagues. So today we're going to have a little introduction on what is the definition of sustainable development. Global warming, climate change and legislation, nice light subjects. Um, a little bit of common and mandatory green and ethical building design terms that you will have seen around town and some you may not have, so just to explain what they are. Then we're going to drill a little, a little bit more into the commercial property market um, and have a little look at a LEED um, case study and what LEED means. John Shannon and Megan Burke are going to talk to us about that. That'll be about 10 minutes or so. Then Brian is going to speak about green leases in Ireland and Brian has great um, knowledge about this. He's, you know, he's just spoken in, in the recent past about it, so he's going to give us um, some insight on that and finally Oliver is going to talk a little bit about the residential property market and he has some great um, feedback as well from developers about their, um, their reaction to the, the sustainable <coughs> measures that they're taking in light of NZ which is coming very soon. Um, we'll have you out in an hour as well just to mention that. Um, so first of all sustainable development, the definition of sustainable development, it comes back to 1987 and the definition comes from Brundtland in the UN from 1987 and the definition is simply the ability to provide for ourselves without compromising future generations abilities to provide for themselves which makes sense and the three pillars of sustainability are environmental economic and social inclusion and social being the part, I think, that sometimes gets missed out and is very important, as you can see from recent events in France and the carbon taxes. Um, to balance and to achieve true sustainability, we need to balance these three pillars in equal harmony. Now, a lot of you know this, but just in brief, um, starting back in the Industrial Revolution, we started to burn a lot more fossil fuels. 
and together with other man-made gases, these have contributed to thickening the, the greenhouse effect around the Earth. And because this is now much denser, when sunlight hits the Earth, it gets trapped underneath this blanket or this greenhouse, and it's warming the Earth. And global warming refers to the long-term planet, sorry, the long-term warming of the planet. But climate change encompasses global warming, but refers to a broader range of changes that are happening to our planet as a consequence of this warming. The consequences of global warming include warming oceans, shrinking ice sheets, glacial retreats, decreased snow cover, sea levels are rising, there are far more extreme weather events, which won't have escaped you, of course, and the oceans are, for, are far more acidic. I think the top one is, even though it was from 2006, is pretty important. It's considered as the greatest and widest ranging market failure ever seen. <coughs> so it's all about, you're going to see one degree and you're going to see 1.5 and you're going to see two degrees a lot. Things are heating up. This refers to how much hotter it is compared to pre-industrial levels. And human-induced warming reached one degree above pre-industrial levels in around 2017. And it's increasing at such a rate that at current rates, the world will reach human-induced levels of 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2040, which is pretty significant. And depending on actions taken between now and then will determine the outcome. Obviously, the hotter that it gets, the more devastating the outcome. And I think, you know, sometimes when you hear 1.5 or 2, it doesn't sound very significant. But the difference between 1.5 degree and 2 degree uh, warming is, for instance, all the coral reefs in Australia going forever because they can't be sustained um, at that level. And it's a huge difference between 1.5 and 2. So it really matters and action needs to be taken. And the projections, um, unfortunately, the track that we're on at the moment, um, this is for the whole world, the track we're on at the moment at the bottom, based on current pledges that the world has made, is going to, um, we're projected to reach warming of 2.9 degrees, which is already catastrophic. But if countries do not act, it could be 4.5, and I don't really know what to say about that, because mm -hmm. it's, it would be unthinkable. Uh, depending on what action is taken now will determine the eventual outcome. And I suppose extreme weather events are something that I wanted to mention as well. Um, obviously, there are huge worldwide extreme weather events, and we all know we've all seen them. But just in the last year or so in Ireland, we've had hurricanes, heat waves, um, snow <coughs> snowstorms. My kids have loved it. But they're obviously hugely disruptive to business and to our lives. There was a report in... Uh, just before Christmas, I haven't read it, I'm just reading about, um, it was discussed in the Dáil and it was in the papers as well. I'd love to get a hold of it. I'm looking for it at the moment. UCC actually did a report, um, which is called Local Authority Coastal Erosion Policy and Practice Audit. And it was looking at coastal erosion in Ireland and how it's going to affect our properties. And the summary of it is that violent storms and warming climate means that hundreds of properties are at risk of being washed into the sea in Ireland. And the report states that 40,000 people in Ireland live, live less than 100 metres from the sea, and that 800 properties and 300 kilometres of roads are at risk of being washed away, particularly in Galway, Louth and Wexford. Seven of the 19 coastal local authorities have land zoned in at-risk areas for housing, commercial or industrial use, even where erosion has been identified. So, we're going to have to talk about legislation, I'm afraid. I think the top banner is probably um, the one I just want to explain a little bit more. So the Paris Agreement in 2015 was really a landmark um, agreement, so I'm just going to talk about that for a second. It came out of COP21, and COP24 was in Poland uh, just before Christmas. Now, COP means the Annual Conference of Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, so it's a UN um, source. And at COP21 in Paris in 2015, 195 countries adopted the first ever universally legally binding climate deal, including the US. An agreement was put on track to avoid or to try and avoid climate change and to try and limit global warming to well under two degrees above pre-industrial levels and ideally um, 
to keep it under 1.5. And at COP24, which was just before Christmas in Poland, Ireland signed up to a new rule book that will come into force in 2020. And again, it reiterated that the worst case scenario is two degrees, but we're going to try and keep it under 1.5. Um, the middle section of the slide, as part of the EU, we have already, and for years, have um, committed to reduce greenhouse gases by 20% by 2020. Now, we fail to meet this, and we're going to be fined by a massive amount, equivalent, um, it's projected, of the building of the Lewis Cross City, which was a bit of a missed opportunity, I think. 40% um, by 2030 and between 80 and 95% by 2050, which is going to require the complete decarbonisation of the Irish economy and every, everything in it. So hopefully we can uh, rise to that challenge. The national, Ireland's first national energy and climate plan 2021 to 2030 is being drafted at the moment. Um, and this is going to um, wrap in all of our, our, um, our path, our intended path to try and meet our obligations. Carbon taxes, um, widely anticipated, they're coming very soon and it's, it's, going to, it's being watched very carefully as to how they're going to be implemented, especially in light of what happened in France. And policy changes on retrofitting buildings is al also widely anticipated both, I feel, particularly for the residential sector, possibly for the commercial sector. And the reason for policy changes coming very soon is because buildings contribute very significantly to the uh, emissions that we produce in this country and across the world. Across the world, the building stock accounts for about 40% of everything, and in Ireland it's 20% for 2015, which is the last date that I could get hold of. And my building surveyor colleagues have asked me to point out that to date in Ireland, we've only really focused on the energy and carbon emissions needed to operate buildings. However, if we are to reduce emissions from new construction, we also need to focus on all areas of the life cycle. And some terms you will have seen and you know well, and some terms you may not be aware of. So first of all, BREAM and LEED on the left-hand side of the slides, they've been around for years. You've seen them on all the new shiny blocks that have been built for the last number of years. And um, LEED originated from the US and BREAM from the UK at a high level, and you guys who are working in this area may disagree with me, but at a high level, they're broadly similar. LEED was inspired <coughs> by BREAM. And their purpose, they say, is to create a framework that allows the market to develop a pathway to a sustainable built environment. But interestingly, neither system guarantees MZEB, which I'll get back to. Well building, the well building um, symbol there on the top right hand side, um, I have to say, I personally, I love the well buildings. Now well, well is, it's very interesting because it focuses on the people in the buildings and not just the actual buildings. And a well building is a building that's not too hot and not too cold. It's got good natural light. Um, you can cycle to work and you've somewhere to put your bike and you've somewhere to have a shower when you've, when you've arrived. And it increases the productivity of those people in the buildings. And it's very, very, it's a very hot topic. Even They've been around for a few years. The first one was in London maybe three years ago. The first one in, in Ireland was Arup down in Cork last year. And now there's one in Dublin. I think I put have their head, their head office. It's, um, it's a really hot topic. And GRESP, finally, bottom right-hand slide. GRESP is also very interesting. GRESP stands for Global Real Estate Susta Sustainability Benchmark. Sustainability is a word we're using a lot today. And it's a global benchmarking tool used by investors to assess and compare environmental performance of real estate portfolios, which is interesting. And they assess it annually, and they can compare and benchmark. So before I, and actually I forgot, I forgot NZEB, see, NZEB is the most important thing and if you only take one thing from today, take away the NZEB message. The centre centre of the slide, we're going to talk about it again in a minute, stands for nearly zero energy building. It's a game changer. It's a mandatory EU uh, requirement. It's been coming for years and years and from next year it is mandatory that all new commercial and residential buildings are built to NZEB standard. Some are already, I believe. 
um, an NZ building uses 60% less energy than what, than what was allowed before, and 20% of this is to be met by renewables. It's a game changer, and it's going to in the, we feel it's going to create a brown discount for the older commercial stock especially, um, when <coughs> benchmarked against the new NZ buildings, especially when they're already Briam and Lead and what have you. So NZEB, if you take one thing away, take away an, an awareness of NZEB. Um, before I hand over to my colleagues John and Megan, I am going to play you a two and a half minute clip from the wonderful David Attenborough, which we think is wonderful. And if we're lucky, we won't have an ad. Right now, we're facing a man man-made disaster of global scale, our greatest threat in thousands of years, climate change. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction <coughs> of much of the natural world is on the horizon. The United Nations provides a unique platform that can unite the whole world. And as the Paris Agreement proved, together we can make real change happen. The world's people have spoken. Their message is clear. Time is running out. They want you, the decision makers, to act now. They're behind you, along with civil society represented here today, supporting you in making tough decisions, but also willing to make sacrifices in their daily lives. To help make change happen, the United Nations is launching the Act Now bot helping people to discover simple everyday actions that they can make because they recognize that they too must play their part. The people have spoken. Leaders of the world, you must lead. The continuation of our civilizations and the natural world upon which we depend is in your hands. Thank you. Okay, John and Megan. Welcome, welcome one and all to the Late Show. I'm your host, Stephen Colbert. <laughs> of course. I come before you tonight to declare that the state of our union is <laughs> Because nobody, nobody knows if we're going to have a state of the union address. This is chaotic, uh, and bitter, and confusing, which is actually the state of our union. You see, here's, here, here's, here's how we got here. This is not a good Could have been worse, yeah. I know. It just occurred to me there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Shannon, and I've prepared a short presentation on LEED certification. Now, as Eloise alluded to, there are many other types of certification that are available, um, but because of the timelines today, we're just going to look at LEED. I suppose it's probably very relevant from an Irish perspective because of the amount of office construction that's got on and how a lot of office buildings are being certified through LEED. So, uh, I have a slightly different figure to Eloise. Um, <laughs> probably should have checked our notes. Uh, buildings and construction account for 36% of global energy use. So a small impact in this area can have a big impact overall. So that's why it's so important to really focus on this. Uh, globally, energy use is increasing. Not surprising. Our population is getting bigger. <coughs> our uh, cities are getting bigger. Uh, however, in some rapidly emerging economies, the level of increase is much higher, albeit it's probably from a much lower base. Uh, by contrast, in the OECD, uh, we're relatively stable. Um, but again, touching back on the Paris Accord, 
we need to improve by an average of 30% just to stay in line with the Paris Agreement. So again, those figures are very important. Uh, deep energy renovations of existing buildings. Um, so this would be tight, your common and house sort of development where buildings are stripped back and modernized are very important because the building stock that exists today, about 65% uh, of the total stock expected in 2060 is already built. So these buildings need to be renovated. They need to be brought up to a modern standard. <coughs> in Ireland, we have a relatively unsophisticated commercial building stock. You might consider the building that we're in. Um, you know, relatively uh, basic upgrades could lead to significant energy savings, uh, such as efficient lighting, improved glazing, and improved heating and cooling. And typically, this sort of Georgian building would be in office use, and those are the sort of things that could make a big impact. Uh, quantifying the benefits uh, is a key element. So, you know, there has to be a measurable improvement or a reason for going down the certification route. And we're talking about uh, less sick days from employees, uh, buildings are cheaper to run and they're more efficient. So they're therefore more attractive to uh, tenants. So LEED. Uh, LEED was introduced in 1998. It's now on version 4. Uh, each time it's gone through an iteration, the level of detail required to achieve certification has increased. Um, it's an internationally recognized uh, system and it's applicable to virtually all building types, whether it's a hospital, a data center, an apartment block, or an office building. Uh, new buildings save energy, water, resources, generate less waste, and support human health, uh, with certification being awarded through a credit system. So I'm just going to run through some of the headings which are required or, uh, in order to, to meet certification. Um, and we'll just go through it here. So first of all, there's the integrative process. Uh, and really this is about finding uh, connections between the building, its environment, uh, and taking advantage of what's there. So the example here is uh, <coughs> how massive an orientation affect HVAC sizing, energy consumption, and lighting. So you might have a building which has a glazed southerly facade, and the developer will have to show how he has uh, integrated his uh, NME to either take advantage of or mitigate whatever effect that will be. And um, the location of transport, again, this one might seem a bit like common sense, like obviously you want your building to be beside the Lewis or you know, easy to get to and easily accessible. Uh, but this category rewards uh, decisions that uh, encourage compact development, alternative transportation, be it Lewis, be it Dublin Bike, be it the DART or whatever system is in place. Uh, well-located buildings take advantage of existing infrastructure, uh, public transport, street networks, etc. Uh, landlord, uh, so location uh, credits encourage robust and realistic alternatives. So you might have uh, bikes in the basement, showers, changing rooms, all that sort of stuff. Uh, sustainable sites. Uh, this focuses on restoring project site elements. So you know, typically you'll have a lot of concrete. It rains very heavily. All that water runoff then hits the system and causes huge problems and overloads capacity. So the development should really be tailoring to meet that expected outcome from having so many hard services. Uh, water efficiency, very important one in terms of how you, uh, how you use it. Uh, the water is looked at in three sections, uh, which is outdoor use, uh, sorry, project that includes grey water reuse and rainwater harvesting, uh, can get credits for outdoor use, indoor use, and for uh, cooling down water use. Uh, energy and atmosphere. So, energy, uh, energy efficiency in a green building starts with a focus on design that reduces overall building needs, uh, such as glazing selection or climate appropriate building materials. And this is an important one. So, in terms of materials and resources, the very best thing that any developer can do is prevent creating the waste in the first place. So that's why prevention is at the top of the pyramid. Um, moving down through it, you've got source reduction, you've got uh, re material reuse, and in cases where reuse isn't available, uh, you know, we're working in waste to energy as long as it's properly filtered. Uh, indoor environmental quality. Uh, this uh, rewards decisions made by project team about indoor quality, thermal, visual, and acoustic comfort. Uh, high quality indoor environments enhance productivity, decrease absenteeism, and prove the building's value and reduce liability for building designers and owners. 
uh, and then the innovation. Uh, so generally, you know, they're looking to encourage people to embrace technology to get a better result, to get a more sustainable building. Um, so if there is a, a tactic that's employed by someone to increase its sustainability that's not covered under the headings, it can be addressed under this one. And then finally, regional priority. Because some issues are particular to a locale, you can get credits if you address them locally. Again, this could be water shortages or it could be other issues that are immediate to the, to the building. Cool. Megan? Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Megan Burke. Um, I'm a surveyor in the office agency team at CBRE. And I'm going to present to you a few real life examples of where LEED has been implemented along with the BRIAM system. Um, BRIAM is more indigenous to Ireland, whereas LEED is a global standard. Um, I think it's important to say I'm not an expert in either of these areas, but I have worked with a number of developers who've implemented LEED and BRIAM into their schemes. So I'll go through two case studies with you now. Um, the first case study is the Seamark building at Elm Park Green in Dublin 4. It's 182,000 square feet of office space. Um, this building was originally designed as a medical centre and a hotel and has been redeveloped into a grade A office. Um, so the developers here have achieved an A3 BEO rating and a LEED Platinum rating. Um, so how do they achieve this? It, it is very technical, so I'm going to go through these points at a very high level, and there's a link at the end then for anyone who wants a bit more information on how to achieve the various points. Um, so the first one, landscaping, um, they tried to encourage biodiversity there by planting a lot of um, green trees and shrubs around the development. Um, transport, which John touched on as well, is very important. The, the site was actually located on the Darton bus line, so they achieve credits there. Um, the building is highly water efficient and works at 30% below the lead platinum baseline, um, which is very strong. There were high energy savings here there as well. Um, there's site savings of 19.7% and energy cost savings of 26.3%. Then moving on to the building materials. Um, as this was effectively a renovation or repositioning of the building, um, they were able to use 93% of the materials from the previous building in the redevelopment. Um, in terms of new materials that were purchased, 27% had been previously recycled as well. Um, and then in terms of regional materials that were sourced, 38.6% um, of regional materials were sourced within a 500 mile radius. Um, waste recycling during the construction phase was also very important and they diverted 97.6% from landfill sites. Um, in terms of the interiors of the building, um, they used low emission paints, um, which are better for the environment as well, throughout. And um, I'll move on to the next slide, which shows you a picture of the full facade. So you can see the full length glazing of the building. This allowed for views, sea views um, within the building for 99.6% of the indoor floor area. Um, so the next few points kind of touch on what we've just said there, um, they're the important points that John had also mentioned in his part of the presentation to ach achieve your LEED Platinum rating. Uh, the second case study is for the Central Bank in the North Docklands, um, it's, occup well, sorry, it's occupied by the Central Bank, it's 207,000 square feet and um, they achieved an outstanding BRIAM rating. Um, so the difference here, BRIAM is a more indigenous um, method compared to LEED and the central bank as a tenant themselves decided to implement the BRIAM rating, whereas with the Seedmark building, it was the LEED was implemented by the developer themselves. So the outstanding rating, um, 
how was this achieved? There was a natural ventilation system on the facade, um, which meant that the building can self-ventilate when the temperature outside is between 14 to 25 degrees Celsius. Um, the plant equipment here was very important. There's a combined heating and power system, um, which reduced costs and CO2 emissions into the environment. Um, in addition, there's a floor-by-floor -floor metering system, which gives the user more transparency around the energy consumption within the building and allows them to um, see where the costs are coming from. Um, again, transport's important. They had implemented extensive shower and bicycle facilities to encourage people to cycle to the building instead of using their cars every day. Um, responsible sourcing of materials was implemented throughout, so that was with the central bank fit out and along with the, f with the development of the building as well. Um, and then in-house, the central bank had established a management team um, to secure the, over the most efficient maintenance of sustainability for the building that they could. Um, so the energy efficiency of this building is, um, the energy efficiency of this building is 91.3%. That's mostly due to the spec of the plant and the ventilation system that were there. Um, transport again is very important in Briam, just like in Leed. Um, the city centre positioning of the scheme made it very easy for them to achieve points in that area. And um, then just moving on to the last point, pollution. Um, the very low emission levels um, within this building due to the spec of all the materials used. Um, so I've just included a link to the O'Connor Sutton Cronin website there at the end. They were the assessors for both of these projects. If anyone wants more information on how they can incorporate LEED or BRIAM into their own schemes, they can, can have a detailed look at that. Thanks. Hand you over to Brian. Brian's going to speak to us now about green uses in the Irish market. He's had good <coughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. So we're wearing the coat, but obviously global warming hasn't got down here yet. Um, it's now generally accepted that the climate change phenomenon, which has been enumerated here earlier, has been responsible for the emergence of an increasing amount of guidance policy and legislation relating to sustainability and the corporate responsibility <coughs> excuse me and uh, these these words actually you know follow on nicely from what megan was saying um you know the measures are aimed in particular at commercial and public properties which are significant consumers of energy green leases are now seen as a critical element in sustainable development in very broad terms they are leases which contain specific provisions in relation to the future sustainable operation of property and buildings. And if you want to achieve what was uh, talked about earlier, you have to put it into contract form. This is what we're talking about. And these can include measures relating to energy efficiency, water reduction, waste management, water efficiency, and so on, as well as the social and ethical <coughs> issues, which we've been talking about earlier as well. And they are used for leases on commercial or public buildings as whether new newly refurbished are existing and typically include obligations for both landlords and tenants. So basically a green lease is a, conditional, is a traditional lease which you're all familiar with, plus additional clauses to create, protect and enhance the property energy performance rating. In terms of sustainability, and uh, for the, it says, you know, your lease will typically uh, encompass the intention of the landlord and tenant to, to promote and reduce emissions, promote and reduce the recycling of waste, and ensure the environmental sustainability of resources in order to improve and be accountable for the energy efficiency of the building. And we suggest a building management forum, it depends on the size of the development obviously, but your building uh, management forum sample clause there, which was taken out of a lease, will uh, consider the adequacy of whatever they, they, they decide to do, um, the energy and the water uh, you know, use, I don't know if that's clear enough. Um, 
and they suggest uh, that a team be put together with people who are likely to turn up to the meetings, which is important. So, in terms of data sharing, uh, the landlord and the tenant shall use the reasonable endeavours to amic amicably agree and comply with the energy management plan to weigh the sustainability of the resources used aimed at uh, improvement of the sustainability of the building to agree to operate initiatives to reduce, reuse and recycle. And the environmental performance data will be shared on a regular basis at times to be agreed uh, with the managing agent and any third party who is considered important to the, uh, to the process. In more simple terms, and talking about lease covenants which you're more familiar with in, repairs, in terms of repairs and decorations, not to carry out any repairs in such manner or using such materials which would adversely affect the energy performance of the building. To carry out decoration in this clause using energy efficient and sustainable products and materials, and not to carry out any such decorations in a manner which would adversely affect the energy performance of the building. Again, in terms of, repair, of repairs, there's a familiar repair clause which you all are familiar with, and at the bottom it says not to carry out any repairs in such a manner or using such materials which would adversely affect the energy performance of the building. That's it in the very simplest form. In terms of alterations, fit out another alteration should not have a negative impact on the energy efficiency of the building. Replacement plant and machinery to be energy efficient and sustainable and prohibition on adverse alterations, which is common enough to term terminology. Um, an alteration and sample clause there, which is uh, sort of a, um, it's the next step on from um, the one you're used to. So not to make any alteration to the demise premises, which would may reasonably be expected to have an adverse effect on the building or the BER. Tend with the landlord's consent shall be in a position to carry out improvements, provided that the improvements uh, will not adversely affect the performance and the life cycle of the mechanical or electrical services, etc. And in carrying out uh, alterations, the tenant should give reasonable consideration to sustainable sourcing, to use of energy efficient and sustainable products and materials recycling and the environmental plan again of the building. So other clauses um, which you probably deal with on an ongoing basis if you're doing rent reviews or lettings. Um, in terms of yielding up, if you're acting for the landlord, the tenant will be required to reinstate where works have adversely impacted the energy performance of a building. And that's generally dealt with through your schedule of dilapidations, as you know, at the end of the lease. The right of inspection by the landlord, obviously, uh, to inspect the, uh, the tenant's energy and water use slash waste production and the right to carry out works which will improve the building efficiency. Uh, how improvements made by the landlord will enhance the building energy performance will be dealt with generally at rent review. In terms of disposal of refuse, the landlord to establish an environmental management plan tenant to comply with this in the disposal of refuse Case in point, there was Mahan Point, which achieved, in terms of waste, 100%. This is in terms of recycling, energy, 80%, and water, 85%. Very high scores. In terms of assignments, assignments, the, uh, uh, the assignee or sub must comply with the terms of the environmental management plan, and it will be reasonable for a landlord to withhold consent to an assignment or a sub-lease uh, from an Dianas on here, so bless you, who will not covenant or comply with the environmental management plan, management plan. In terms of rent reviews, the usual disregard that the tenant's works are to be disregarded at rent review. And uh, it should deal with how are Im improvements made by either the landlord or the tenant which enhance the environmental management plan and overall building performance will be dealt with. That depends on the wording in the rent review clause, but should be encouraged. Building energy rating is now a hot topic at rent review time, which is, uh, as you can understand from uh, the presentation there given by Megan and the 
example she's given, you can imagine that at the rent review time, the surveyors will be arguing for, your, for you know, a higher rate per square metre or square foot, depending on the energy efficiency of the building. And the evidence on the, you know, for those arguments is building. In terms of service charges, services implemented uh, using sustainable and energy efficient uh, materials, cleaning products, plant and machinery. Cleaning times should be programmed to minimise the use of lighting, heating and air conditioning. And uh, they suggest the use of a separate heading in the service charges which would show the result of the, of the environmental initiatives so that it uh, creates a transparency for tenants, therefore you know, a greater buy-in. In terms of disputes, the uh, collaborative process is preferred to have a clear, well-defined um, you know, remedial action regime. Uh, I suggest a middle ground such as mediation or arbitration and raise through the building management forum and obviously allow a reasonable remedial time period for the actions to be carried out, remedial actions to be carried out. So the next steps, the society will, uh, will produce an addendum to its uh, leasing code for landlord and tenants. From now on, it suggested that heads of terms should include reference to sustainability or green clauses where appropriate. In time, we won't be calling them green leases or green clauses anymore, they'll just be standard. Uh, the H of terms should clearly state the tenant's obligations concerning building energy efficiency, which may incur material costs, but that's, that's, that's only fair. Uh, you know, we place restrictions on the tenant's fit out or have implications for the use of the property. And these can obviously be applied to all types of buildings on an incremental basis. So, what do you say to your clients who are skeptical about this and say, as we've come across often, what's it going to cost me? And then, you know, you know, the typical argument is, well, what's the landlord going to do about it? Uh, so, this is, this is how we see the benefits. For the landlord, uh, the asset value is maintained and enhanced. Increased rental value due to the lower building operational costs. Enhances the appeal of buildings to high caliber. To, uh, to high caliber tenants. And of course, trends toward green securitization. It would be much easier to get a, a, you know, a loan from a bank if your building is and ends up building or equivalent. Um, and this is well established now. And for the tenant's point of view, the framework to lower building operational costs, sharing the investment cost to reach energy efficiency targets, sustainable workplaces increase productivity and satisfaction. Uh, and there's plenty, of, uh, there's plenty of research on that. Um, encourages a relationship of collaboration to meet corporate social responsibility objectives. So that's me. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Brian. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so, yeah, as we were saying earlier, um, that the average Irish dwelling um, uh, emits more than, or, or sorry, uh, emits 58 percent more energy rated uh, CO2 than the average EU dwelling. Uh, from the SAI, um, up to a million homes are going to need a, a deep retrofit uh, in Ireland, with a cost of of circa 30 to 50 thousand euro per, per house. I'll come on to that more in a little while. Um, it's a huge challenge, uh, but it's also a major economic. Uh, and employment opportunity. Um, deep retrofit, which I'm going to give you a, 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 an example of later, offers a complete overhaul of the energy efficiency of the house, which is better than uh, carrying out piecemeal uh, small jobs um, over a longer period of time. The graph shows uh, how quickly um, legislation change can bring about physical change to the built environment. So as you can see there, from sort of pre-1941, uh, being most inefficient or, or, or uh, very low energy efficiency to uh, 2016 at the other end of the scale there where we have new dwellings um, 
reaching uh, a rated uh, a, an, a, an A rating by BER standards and uh, um, under current uh, part L, which is 2011, which has recently just been amended, but under 2011, the homes are, re are reaching an A3 uh, standard. So, um, one thing we wanted to do was just give an example of um, of what different what, of what's going on in different parts of the country. And one example is a great, a great example is Tipper Tipperary Energy Agency uh, have set up a program called Super Homes, uh, is to assist homeowners. Uh, in deep retrofitting their home and just to give you a, an example of what deep retrofit means it could be replacement of windows, external or internal insulation of the external walls, replacement of the heating system with an air source heat pump or um, photovoltaic solar for power and then reducing air leakage while improving ventilation. Um, so the, the, the intention here is that they get um, a, a, a group of, of, of houses in an area together to to improve to, to kind of to, to, to do this deep retrofit um, uh, as a group and they, they, they would use a, a main contractor to manage the different works going on in the building um, so that it's it, it's 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 kind of you know as painless as possible for the homeowner um, and as you can see there um, uh, there is funding available um, but it probably doesn't reach, it probably doesn't go quite far enough. So I suppose there's some minimum mandatory measures that, that the super home scheme has put in place uh, to provide a, a renewable primary heating system uh, through an air source heat pump, um, uh, advanced ventilation, uh, either heat recovery or demand control ventilation, which I'll come on to in a little while on, on the case study, uh, and then trying to reduce air, air permeability. And then other measures then, as you can see, uh, as I've touched on already, um, insulation of walls, roofs, uh, wi window replacement, even glass replacement. I'm sure you're all sick of hearing on the, on the radio at the moment. I, I, I certainly am about any glazes and how they can, they can uh, change out glass. And then there's different glass you can put into period buildings within the existing frame. So there's, the, the industry is trying to, to get there in terms of providing solutions that are really workable. Um, so then the average cost in 2017 through the super home scheme was 33, uh, that's sorry, the net, uh, the average net cost, so that's once you've taken grants away, was 33,000 uh, euro, which is a, a significant sum uh, to come up with for uh, uh, by the homeowner. Um, but then you would then get a, a payback of uh, by savings through um, your uh, reduced bills of 1,250 euro per annum. As, as it says here, it's helpful, but there's still a long payback. Um, so uh, I think there needs to be further government grants available uh, to kickstart this sector, uh, which is hopefully anticipated. Um, please go to the, you can look on the superhomes.ie um, uh, web um, address there. So then NZEB, we've talked about it at the very start uh, from Aloise. Um, the if I can just give you a, a, a definition from the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland is uh, it means a building that has a very high energy performance, the nearly zero or very low amount of energy required should be covered to a very high significant extent by energy from renewable, resor sorry, renewable sources, including energy from renewable sources produced uh, on site or nearby. So quite a long-winded uh, definition there, but um, it's really about trying to maximise energy efficiency. Um, I suppose um, what I wanted just to point out there was there's two parts here. So we've got a new part L for buildings other than dwellings, so commercial buildings, industrial buildings, and so on. Uh, that was that was uh, brought out in 2017 for for um, employment in 2018, and then for the residential uh, sector, we've got the 2011 Part L, which has been amended in 2017, but it still is called it's still a 2011 um, uh, Part L, uh, and what that requires, and, and the reason why that's been done is, I suppose, the, on the dwellings front. Uh, there's been a massive push already uh, since 2011 
uh, and we've already reached a, 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 a much better level of energy efficiency in dwellings. The real challenge now is to bring the commercial stock, uh, uh, which requires a 60% improvement uh, on, on, the, on the previous regulations, whereas um, in terms of in terms of NZEB, it's looking for us to 25% improvement on dwellings. So 60% on, 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 on commercial and 25% on, on uh, residential. Um, so, uh, and then again, touched on these, but these are the areas where new dwellings, the, the, uh, the elements of, the, of a dwelling where there can be improvements made, and then existing dwellings again, um, C, D, E, and F above there are all areas where you would target to improve the energy efficiency of an existing home versus a new home. Um, so a case study then from a large house builder that I received, they remain nameless. Um, they, uh, they have basically tried various things out and uh, they've kind of had a bit of resistance, met a bit of resistance from home homeowners. Um, uh, so, you know, they've kind of come back to providing gas boilers uh, photovoltaic, photovoltaic panels and a demand control ventilation, uh, which uses um, air vents in the in windows, um, uh, trickle vents, and also wall vents, uh, but combined with a, a more intelligent uh, extract system. Um, they, they have tried air, air to water heat pumps, they tried underfloor heating with aluminium rads on the first floor uh, and heat recovery ventilation, but what they found is that homeowners just couldn't grapple, they couldn't get, they couldn't get the new technology and uh, you know they were maybe having older family kind of coming in and saying, Jesus that, that, that radiator is cold, you know, how, how is that, that's not working, you know. People are sort of still struggling to grasp, you know, how the new, these new te technologies work, and so this house builder anyway has gone back to the the bullet points there on the on the left hand side of the screen, um, uh, and what they're saying is, you know, replacement costs are cheaper for boiler replacement than for heat pump. Uh, some suppliers are just not capable of providing high quantity of of, of, of new technologies uh, to meet their demand. Um, Obviously, heat recovery ventilation, while more intelligent than demand control ventilation, uh, can be switched off. And what they were finding was that homeowners were literally just flicking the switch to try and save energy, and then their rooms were turning black with mould uh, because there was literally no ventilation. The house was completely sealed, and and it was just creating a very a very uh, unhealthy environment. Um, so that's why they've kind of pulled back to, to, to a more simpler traditional uh, me, uh, term, uh, technology. Um, I suppose then just to give you an idea of the types of cost increase to bring us up to the 2011 Partel um, uh, on the various different aspects to do with uh, around air tightness, provision of uh, photovoltaic panels, um, upgrades to insulation, external glazing, thermal bridging details, uh, amounting to around ten thousand euro. Um, and then what we're what we're what we're what, what, what they're anticipating is a further ten five to ten percent, or could be higher, cost to reach the NZEB standard. Um, but at least that gives you some indication. Sorry, and that and that and that's per dwelling. So that's the uplifting cost per dwelling to bring to the 2011 Partel, and obviously then further cost then for ends up. Um, so I suppose then it brings me it closes up really, uh, it, you know, um, uh, the talk for me anyway. Uh, the key actions as, as I see it, or as we see it, really is I suppose on one hand the house buyers need to be educated better by the builders to operate the heating and ventilation systems installed. Uh, it's not just a case of just saying here are the manuals and off you go. Um, the, you know, there needs to be a bit more uh, education there, um, and they need to think up some new ways of doing that. Um, equipment plant suppliers, you know, they, they need to be able to meet the demand of house builders to, to, to supply that new technology uh, uh, within the country. Um, um, and then, lastly, then to tie into what we said before about. Um, and, uh, and ties into the super home scheme, the grants from SEAI, in, my, in our view, need to be increased or extended to act as a greater incentive to get homeowners, existing homeowners, to, to carry out deep retrofit works. Um, and as I say, that, that brings it close to, to, to my uh, part, and really then 